Hi guys, my name is Mansi Anand and I welcome you to this series called RBI 24-7. So guys, as most of you would be knowing that in this series, we discuss a set of five questions that can be of use to you if you are preparing for competitive exams, right? So let's not waste any time and move straight away to the questions. But before doing that, guys, I would like to ask you to subscribe to our channel. So if you are watching our video for the very first time, then do not forget to hit the subscribe button. It can help you to stay in touch with us. And if you press this bell icon, it can help you to get notified whenever a new video comes up. You can also join our telegram group. On this group, you can post all your doubts and queries and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible, either on the group or we can get doubts from telegram and solve them in these videos, right? And apart from that, if you ever have any doubt, you can always mention them on the videos and we try to take them up uh, as soon as possible so that we can easily resolve your doubts, right? So are you ready for question number one? Here is our question number one. Okay. This question says, there exists a relationship between number of shares and volatility. In regard to that, select the correct option. Okay. Here we are talking about some sort of a uh, relationship that exists between the number of shares that are there and the impact that they have on the volatility of these shares, right? So you have to select the correct option which defines the correct relationship between these two factors, right? So moving ahead to the solution and the solution says that the correct option is C. C means this one, when the number of free floating shares is more, it indicates lower volatility. So basically, there exists an inverse relationship between free floating shares of a company that are there and so the more the number of free floating shares, the lower is the volatility right so what is the meaning of volatility that means the movement in the prices of shares right so that means if a company that is having a lot of shares that are available for trade in the market so what are free floating shares free floating shares means that those shares which are available for the trading which are available to the traders for trading right so these are the shares which can lead to price fluctuations in the uh, in the market uh, when investors they buy them or they sell them right so these are free floating shares which are available for trading and volatility means that how much is the change is in the price of a share whether the price is going up or whether the price is going down so how much is the volatility okay so we will learn about the uh, reason behind this relationship first of all we are studying this under free float methodology right so under this free float methodology the number of free floating shares inversely related to the volatility right and now why is so see imagine a company which is very huge in size massive company and it has a lot of free floating shares right so that means if you need to move the price of share up and down, you need to buy and sell a lot of shares, then only an investor would be able to make a dent in the price, right? So uh, if you buy a small number of shares or you buy lesser number of shares, then there is going to be, uh, there is not going to be a huge change in price. There is only going to be a small change, right? So that means for a company of massive size which has a large number of free floating shares available for trading, investors need to buy a lot of shares if they want to push the prices up or they need to sell a lot of shares if they need to, if they want to pull the prices down, right? So that is why the larger the number of the shares, the lower is the volatility because it, then it becomes difficult to move the price if there are, if the number of floating shares is uh, more, right? But if, on the other hand, we consider a company which is smaller in size, less number of free floating shares, then it might be easier for investors to uh, buy some, buy those uh, shares and then move the prices because already the available shares are very less and you can easily move the prices, right? So this is the correct option, okay? 
So moving ahead to the solution, here you can see we have discussed most of the things which are mentioned here. Pre-float methodology, method of calculating market capitalization of a stock market index. See guys, why do we calculate index? So I think we all must have heard the name of indices like Sensex, Nifty or if we go international S&P 500 or MSCI. Right, so we have all, I think uh, we all are familiar with such names. So what are these? These are nothing but basically an average of performance of certain companies that are there in the stock market, right? This is like Sensex calculates for 30 companies, Nifty calculates for 50 companies, S&P 500 for 500, right? So basically we are just taking a sample out of the whole industry uh, a limited number of industries and we are trying to analyze okay these industries are performing like this that means uh, they are representing the entire market so entire market is performing like this obviously there can be deviations in the movement of these indices and the actual uh, reality of the market but they are like representations which give us an idea that how is market going what is the condition of industry whether uh, whether firms are getting businesses or whether they are making profit or they are making losses, right? So these are indices, basically just an average of performance of certain uh, sample of companies that is derived from the market, right? So now if we want to calculate such indices, we can do it by different different methods. So under free float methodology, we take the method of market capitalization. That means we are trying to calculate these indices on the basis of market capitalization of a company. So a company which has a larger market capitalization uh, is, is going to have a huge impact on that, ind on that index um, in relation to a company which has a smaller market cap. Now what is this market cap? Simply, see, when you multiply the free floating shares of a company with the price of one share. So you get the value of all the free floating shares of the company. So basically you get market capitalization of the company. So market capitalization is nothing but the value of free floating shares of a company. Now you can also measure these indices on the basis of price of one share without taking into account the number of free floating shares, right? So basically there are different methodologies. Here we are talking about the methodology which talks about market cap, right? So under free float, market capitalization is calculated by taking equities price and multiplying it by number of shares readily available for trade, that is free floating shares, right? So in this, we are taking free floating shares rather than all the shares of a company because there are certain number of shares of a company which are not available for trade because they are held by either insiders like employees of the company who are not eager to sell these shares right they 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 try they have a tendency to hold on to the shares held by promoters held by governments right so these shares are not available for trading so basically take all the shares of a company reduce these locked in shares right then you get the free floating shares multiply it by price you get the market capitalization right so larger free float means lower volatility because there are more traders buying and selling the shares right so many institutional investors they prefer trading companies with a larger cap because they can buy or sell large number of shares without moving the price right so because if let's say there is big bank or if, uh, let's say there's a mutual fund which wants to invest in a certain company and it doesn't want uh, it doesn't want the price of the company to spike when it invests in it. So it, it would tend to invest in a company that is having a larger market uh, capitalization so that it does not impact that much the market price of uh, that particular company, right? So moving ahead to the next question. Okay, in this question we are talking about Okay, let me just read the question. This question says following are some statements about different indices which of the following statements are not correct. Moving ahead to the uh, correct option, guys, you can pause the video here and give it, give them a thorough read and then decide with your answer. Okay, the correct option is option B. Option B means 1 and 2. 
So option one and two they are not correct. Whereas option three is correct. Right. So we just learned about what are indices, and I told you we can calculate them by either taking into account market cap or we can just calculate them on the basis of price of the share of a company. So see the difference between the two is here you are considering two factors for analyzing a company's performance: number of free floating shares and price. of the price of one share here we are only considering one factor that is price of the share right so it does not take into account number of shares right so the, these are two methodologies now here coming to the statements first statement it says price weighted index versus capitalization index indices are quite similar as methodology is not very different so this is not true they give uh they give different results to you when see if you analyze this performance of same companies by these two methods you will uh, there are more chances that you will see a difference in them so there there are differences in them that is why they are not that similar the approaches are entirely different so the statement is wrong after that in the trading market very few indexes are indices are capitalization weighted so this is not correct most of the indices that we talk about that we use they are capitalization or market cap weighted very few are price weighted so one of these few is dow jones industrial average this is one popular index which is based on which is based on price rather than the market cap that is why the third statement is correct first and second are incorrect right so moving ahead to the solution okay so indexes in market usually weighted either by price or market cap market cap most common methodology i just told you this leading market weighted index in us is s&p 500 very popular index in a price weighted index stocks with higher price receive higher weighting so as, as i just told you that under price methodology that company is going to have a larger impact whose price is value is more but in case of market cap we are considering two factors so results can be entirely different right so it gives you the formula of market cap right moving ahead to the next question okay here is the third question for today it says pulchan tripathi is a young man who is very ambitious he is an he he has an entrepreneurial spirit and from his college days he has been working on the idea of a start okay but the but the point is that munna here does not want any publicity for his idea as it is vulnerable to imitation if it gets out in the public so what type of company you should go for so there is a man who is very ambitious and is thinking of going for a company he wants to own a startup uh he wants he wants to go for a startup he wants to own a company he wants to become an entrepreneur and but the point here is that he doesn't want too much publicity for it he wants to keep it a secret he wants to uh he wants his idea to remain a secret until and unless he is ready to portray it to the world right so what type of company should he go for moving ahead to the solution and the correct option for this question is option e option e means stealth mode startup i think it's it's, a, it's an easy question if you know the meaning to the word stealth which means moving by caution or being careful right not uh, taking any reckless steps uh, uh, trying to move with baby steps right so correct uh, answer is stealth mode startup basically if we talk about a stealth mode startup it is a company where the promoters with the with the founders of the company they do not want any publicity for their idea they think that let us keep it a secret let us try to work on it secretly and let us not allow the public to know about it okay so basically uh i think uh, this is a common trend in companies where they give a code name to one of their projects let's say if if there is uh, a company that manufactures computers if it's working on a new model then it's going to name its project it is going to give some code name to its project because it does not want its competitors to know that what is it working on or it does not want media to know about it because see what if the media knows about it and then they are not able to pull it off then they are going to feel 
it's huge insights right so basically keeping it a secret unless and until you are ready to give it out to the world right so that is a stealth mode startup so microsoft has been popular in this terms giving code names to their project and then uh, bringing out the launch of the product and then showing it to the world So stealth mode startup, startup company that operates in stealth mode avoids public attention. Right. So this thing has its own advantages and disadvantages that we are going to discuss. This may be done to hide information for competitors as I just told you or it can be a part of marketing strategy. Basically it can be to create suspense also that, uh, uh, that media knows that you are working on some project which has a code name this. But they don't know what are you working on or they have no idea. So it might create some suspense, right? So, um, so uh, to create uh, to, to create some sort of suspense, to create some sort of mystery in the market or to portray your company as working on something really important. Okay, advantage is here, protects intellectual property. If you do not want, if you think the idea can be stolen by your competitor, probably they might be able to launch it sooner than you, then obviously you're going to face laws, your research is going to go to way. Right, in that case, if you want to protect that idea, this is a mode to go for benefit of anonymity. Basically, no one knows that who is going to come out in the open with what idea. So there is benefit of anonymity because you're keeping it a secret after that control of public image no negative publicity because uh, media does not know about what are you doing after that disadvantages impedes finding the right market fit so if you want to um, test your product or if you want that uh, you should know, you should find how, uh, that what is the target audience for your product then these decisions are going to be a bit difficult if you're not communicating it to the target audience so this is one of the disadvantage Restricts buzz. So, this might lead to uh, this might lead to lesser creation of buzz because if you're not telling media about what are you doing or if you're not uh, letting your customers know about your idea, they might lose interest in it. So, restriction of buzz, limited feedback. As I just told you, that it is difficult without communicating. So, if you communicate, people know what are you working on. You might be able to test it. You might be able to take different opinions, but uh, this feedback gets limited in this mode of company because things are kept secret. Okay, so this was one of the doubt from a session, and um, basically that person asked the difference between a stealth mode startup and a dormant company. Dormant company is a company which is not doing any operations or which are which is not carrying out any operations of a normal company. Right, so dormant company is not operational, whereas a stealth mode startup is operational but it's kept a secret so that is the difference i hope uh, this helps you moving ahead okay there is a fourth question for today which says what does it refer to in the following statements okay two statements given to you you have to uh, tell that what is the meaning of it here moving ahead to the solution and the solution says that the correct option is d d means earnest money deposit Okay, earnest money deposit. So basically, let us try to understand with the help of an example. Let's say you are thinking of buying a house and you go to uh, a society, let's say you are thinking of buying a flat into Ghaziabad, you go there, you see that many developers are building societies there, so I, I should just go and check it out. So you go there and check out different flats and then you like some of them, you like, let's say there is one flat that you really like uh, so much and you can picture yourself living there for the next coming 20 years. You want to buy it, but still there is some amount of risk. You're not sure, you want to consult your parents, you want to consult your friends. So uh, for that, uh, you try to book that flat by giving some amount of money to the builder or to the to the person who is to the uh, uh, person who is authorized to do it to collect your money so you give some amount of money to him and then you go home take con uh, you consult your parents consult your relatives and then you later decide that whether you want to buy it or not but 
see here risk is involved for both of you because if you pay the entire amount and you buy that flat and then you consult your parents and you find out there is some sort of problem in that house then it's going to be really difficult for you whereas uh, if you don't come and buy that house and you just book it and go away and never come back to that builder it is risk for that particular person because he might not be able to sell it or he might turn away some customers just because he has booked the flat for you right so this earnest money means a, a part of a deposit which has been made uh, to buy a product that you are interested in but you are not sure that is why you have made a certain amount of contribution towards it and if you don't buy it it gets uh, forfeited or it gets refunded depending upon the policies right so there is earnest money deposit refers to a deposit buyer makes on a home that they want to purchase gives the buyers extra time to get financing and conduct research about the property just as i told you that you can go back to your friends and relatives your parents and you can consult them you can do research you can talk to people living there that whether the investment is good or not right so that is earnest money let us learn some more things about it okay so deposit made to a seller that represents buyers good faith to buy a home good faith means that you are placing your money with that seller with the trust that you are going to come back and uh, give the rest of the money to the seller and buy that particular house right so earnest money deposit is a very common term which is used in the sector of real estate and it is also used in the sector of government procurement we are going to discuss about it so good faith deposit of money into an account by buyer to show he or she has intent of completing the deal and coming back to buy the asset contract is written up during the exchange of earnest money that outlines the conditions for refunding the amount that if you don't come back whether you will get the money back or not or if you will get some proportion of it back so all those things are put into a contract right earnest money deposit can be anywhere from 1 to 10% of the sales price depending mostly upon the market interest right so it is usually 1 to 10% of the sale price so if you are uh, looking to buy a flat of worth rupees 50 lakh it might range around 50000 to 5 lakh depending upon where you are thinking of buying it right so in government procurement also see whenever government is thinking to buy some goods or it is thinking of giving some contract let's say government wants to build a road and it gives uh, this contract it wants to give contract to a construction company for it and there are many construction companies that are bidding for it that are telling the government that we are going to build it on a very cheap uh, within a very cheaper price give the contract to us we'll do it do you work at lesser prices but what if someone quotes that they are going to do it in good quality at a very lesser price and then they they are unable to complete the deal so to mitigate these type of risks this emd or earnest money deposit is taken from that particular bidder right so one company which is bidding for government take uh, getting government contract deposit some amount with government and if they do not complete the deal their amount is forfeited or some proportion of it is forfeited so this word this term is also mentioned here and this is this ranges around usually 1 to 10 per 10% of the contract price right so uh, to ensure that the, the builder does not submit a dummy bid or back out and government does not face any loss collects a small refundable fee from each bidder which is called emd right so announcing and now there has been some recent announcement regarding this right uh, what is this announcement announcing support for construction and infrastructure uh, the finance minister she refers to fm nirmala sitaraman said that earnest money deposit and performance security requirements will be relaxed for government tenders so basically they are saying that we are thinking of doing away with this deposit so that more businesses can bid for it so there might be some businesses which are interested to bid but they do not have such sort of money to deposit emd so that is why they are thinking of uh, doing away with earnest money deposit or at least reducing the uh, the percentage that is charged for it so that more businesses are able to bid for it right will not be required for tenders and will be replaced by bid security declaration right 
so they are thinking of doing away with this so uh, guys recently there has been announcements some more announcements by finance minister uh, which is being quoted as atmanirbhar package 3.0 and that has been, so this is also part of those requirements we are not uh, talking about them here because manish sir has covered them in great detail in pip 247 right so you can watch that if you want to have a detailed perspective about these new measures right so i would suggest you to definitely watch it so you uh, you are going to get um, detailed information about it right Moving ahead to the last question. Here is your last question for today, which says select the correct statement about expression of interest. So this also comes from your uh, doubts. Uh, expression of interest, the meaning of it. So five statements given to you, which explain the meaning of this term. You have to select the correct one. Moving ahead to the solution, and the solution says that the correct option is option C. Option C means. expression of interest indicates an serious interest from the buyer that their company would be interested to pay a certain valuation and acquire seller's company through a formal offer right so this seems little complicated let us try to understand it with the help of examples okay you all are familiar about jet airways or uh, i um ILFS the debacle that happened right so these type of companies whenever some debacle happens government tries to sell them right they are also looking for some buyers for air india right so uh, whenever companies are in financial distress and they are looking for sale let's say they are not even in financial distress but they are looking out for buyers the, the owners are looking to sell their company then they invite expression of interest from the potential buyers that okay we are interested to sell our company uh, you come with a contract you come with the offer and then we'll decide that uh, who is going to be the buyer right so expression of interest simply means a declaration or a document by an interested buyer that okay i am interested to buy your company right so now it seems a bit easier serious interest from the buyer so the buyer is showing interest that i want to buy your company that their company would be interested to pay a certain valuation and acquire seller's company through a formal offer right so many times you see that for air india or for jet airways many expressions of interest they come from foreign companies but then the deal doesn't work out right so this is a very common terms and i think uh, as long as we are seeing a rise in npas or we are seeing companies going bad going bankrupt Uh, this term has been in news for a very long time okay expression of interest one of the initial transaction document which is shared by the buyer in a potential mergers and acquisitions deal they are a major part of mergers and acquisitions deal eoi also ensures that the buyer is interested and ready to pay a certain amount basically it tells about the willingness of the buyer so many times government they try if they have to sell a bad company or a company which is debt ridden they try to provide some intense uh, incentives to sweeten the deal so that uh, they can increase the number of potential buyers or they can increase the number of companies who are interested to buy the particular sell, uh, company which is being sold it includes so uh, what are the contents of expression of interest includes details like purchase price the price that the interested buyer is offering valuation methodology that how have they calculated this particular price how have they calculated the value of the company that are, they are interested to buy confidentiality due diligence that if they want to check that whatever sellers are telling about their company whether it is correct or not transaction structure how they are going to pay management retention whether they are going to fire the existing employees or they are going to keep them confidentiality transaction transaction exp expenses that who, who is going to pay the expenses right there's a lot and lot of people work in such deals right so this is expression of interest so guys these were the five questions for today and i hope you have learned something new from this video before ending this session i would like to tell you a few things okay uh, first of all there was a doubt uh, one of you asked in the comments that uh, so that was a question about current yield when we discussed that when the the investors they buy bond on a discount their current yield becomes more than the coupon rate because they have a profit they they are buying the asset at lesser than their face value 
right so one of you asked that uh, why would anyone be interested to buy a bond at premium because if they buy it at premium they are buying it at higher than market price and their current yield might come down from the uh, as compared to the coupon rate so the reason behind this is very simple because they think that uh because they think that Uh, that this bond is going to gain value even more than the premium that they have, they pay for they ha they had pay for it they had to pay for it right because they think that okay this is the price now and this is going to gain in future and if i don't buy it now this might be uh, this might be uh, higher right so they think that it's okay if i have to pay a little premium here i can cover it with the gain that i am going to have in future right so simply gain incentive okay and uh, one more thing i asked you about two questions in monday and tuesday sessions i asked you two questions to answer most of you have answered only one question and ishita has answered the, uh, both the question so uh, good going ishita and your answers are correct most of you have answered correctly but i would like it more if if you answer all the questions that i asked you to right so that is that is going to be benefit for uh, that is going to be beneficial for you guys only right and one more thing okay in for in the beginning in the beginning questions we discussed about market indices so basically india in many indian companies have been added to one index and it, it is being uh, viewed as a good sign for indian economy in one sorry um, many indian companies have been added to one very popular index so this so you have to read about it and mention the details in the comments that which is that index that i am talking about and is it going to benefit india or not right so try reading about some companies the very popular companies which are being added to this index right so i hope to see a lot and lot of answers in the comments until then you take care of your health keep your studies going on and i'll be back in next session with some new information until then goodbye and take care and thank you for being here